Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I'm back from Dayton Hambenchen and it was a success. I found a replacement case for my Heathkit AV3 meter, but that's a topic for another day because in this episode, I'm gonna show you the Heathkit HW101 that I bought while I was there. And as you'll see, it really needs some love and attention. Let's get to it. The Heathkit HW101 is a vacuum tube amateur radio transceiver that was available in kit form from 1970 until about 1983. According to various online sources, the HW101 was one of Heathkit's highest selling amateur radio products of all time. Somewhere between 30,000 to 40,000 units were sold over those 13 years. And it's immediately apparent when you do an online search that a large fan base for the Hot Water 101, as it's sometimes called, is still active even in 2022. I had no issue finding lots of restoration and repair details online. Now, being a relative newcomer to collecting Heathkit gear, I'm always on the lookout at Hamfest and online for the next tempting item to add to my collection. So I guess it was no surprise that an HW101 would eventually catch my eye, and that's exactly what happened at the Dayton Hambenchen last week. I'm also always on the lookout for a challenging repair and restoration project. Just look at the series I did on the Halicrafters SX140 and HT40 as good examples. And as time goes by, the more difficult the challenge is, the more likely I am to take it on. So keep all that in mind when I show you what I bought. So with that said, here's the beauty that I bought. <laughs> I'll let you guys take it in for a few seconds. For sure, it's not supposed to be golden brown. Here's an example of what it's supposed to look like, the typical Heathkit shades of green. My first question to the ham selling it was, had it been in a fire? The response was no. The former and now deceased owner was a heavy cigar smoker. So if that's truly all it was, then this is the heaviest and grossest coating of nicotine and smoke residue that I have ever seen on a radio. Even the dial window is so coated with that gunk that you can barely see the markings on the rotor. The controls all still rotate, so it's at least got that going for it. Although I didn't try the band switch, that's one that can be easily broken if it's seized. The rest are potentiometers or variable caps or simpler switches. And of course, the meter is almost completely opaque too. Rounding out the rest of the exterior assessment, the paint's coming off over large areas on the top cover. So that's a tricky issue in restoration because getting even a close color and texture match to the Heathkit factory paint would be a big challenge. But at least all the rear jacks and connectors look to be intact. Moving on, let's have a look under the lid. Yep, I am wearing gloves and doing this in a well-ventilated area. And not surprisingly, the inside is also a horror show. Right off the bat, I see several pistachio shells, which of course is a clear indicator that mice were inside the radio at some point. So in addition to the nicotine residue everywhere, there's likely to be vermin excrement on the circuit boards. Nice. So let's go over all the upsides. All the tubes and crystals look to be present. And that's about it. Wait, before I get ahead of myself, better check to see if the 6146 finals are still present. Those are moderately expensive nowadays, especially when you need to buy a matched pair. And it looks like they're here. And of course, all the bits and pieces nearby are nicely coated in smoke tar. Let's flip it over and have a look inside the beast. And not surprisingly, the paint's peeling on the bottom cover too. I'm not sure if the peeling paint has anything to do with the smoke residue. I wouldn't think that it would lift the paint. But something's seriously wrong with the paint adhesion because in those areas where it's coming off the aluminum, the aluminum is completely bare. There's nothing. No primer, no small flakes that did stick. It's just gone. Okay, hold your breath because I sure did. Well, this actually doesn't look too bad. There's not large-scale corrosion on the circuit boards, at least. The wiring doesn't look like it has a serious problem. Both the single sideband and CW filters are present. At least that means nobody got to the rig to harvest these goodies before I got it. Setting aside the radio for just a moment, it also came with an SB600 speaker with an HP23 power supply inside it. And of course, it's in just as bad a shape 
maybe even worse. The construction is similar to that used by Drake, meaning the housing contains a separate modular power supply that you can attach inside the SB600 cabinet or just mount it remotely. Removing it is pretty easy. It is a bit heavy, so you have to keep it under control and not let it just fall out. And not surprising, more pistachio shells. Where there's one, there's bound to be more. And oh boy, not gonna dump this mess on the workbench. All right, I said I wanted a harder challenge and here it is. Now, of course, there's a few questions to ask at this point. First and foremost, is this even recoverable at this point? And secondly, if it is, how much is that gonna cost and is it gonna be worth spending that money in the end? To answer the first question, I pretty much just have to clean it up and assess all the components. And that doesn't really cost anything other than my time. The second question gets a lot murkier. Given the sorry state that this rig is in, it's probably not even possible to restore this to factory-like new condition. Best case scenario is I get it functional and add it to the regular rotation of rigs I use for my HF work. So that puts a common sense limit on what I'm willing to spend on this project. There's an emotional element here as well. There's only a finite number of these rigs left in the world. I mean, after all, Heathkit's not making any more of these, and I'd sure hate to declare another one beyond salvage. But I'll save those hard decisions for later if I even have to make them at all. Right now, it's back to cleaning and assessment. Now, as nasty as this smoke residue is, at least it's easy to completely remove it from bare metal surfaces. Painted surfaces, circuit boards, and of course cloth are all more challenging. As I've talked about in my previous videos, I use a diluted mixture of 50% super clean and 50% water. It's essentially a strong base and it cuts right through this residue, mostly because the constituents of the residues are oil based. Of course I'm wearing gloves, the solution can burn, and I definitely don't want that nasty gunk on my skin. I'm also doing the work outside over the lawn with a nice breeze blowing. Now this piece did require a second application and second scrubbing, but in the end after a water rinse, the residues are gone. Here's the case for the SB600 with one of the sides cleaned, and as I said, painted surfaces can be more challenging. There's definitely some permanent discoloration that I can't completely remove, even after I switched over to use full strength super clean. And after a lot of scrubbing, this is the best I could get it to look. I also had to spray it down with diluted vinegar to get rid of the last of the smoke odor, which might have been lingering in the hard to clean ventilation holes. But realistically, yeah, it needs to be repainted. There's plenty more cleaning ahead of me, but I decided to switch over now to test the vacuum tubes and see just how many of them are duds. Notice I didn't say how many are good. Even with the best tube tester, you can't tell for sure if a tube is going to work completely correct until you put it in the circuit you're going to use it in. Even so, my basic Sencor tube tester does a reliable job of finding the obvious duds. And after going through all 20 of them, there's only one that was a hard fail for shorts and for grid leakage. Unfortunately though, it's one of the two 6HS6s. Those are hard to find and they're expensive. They're north of 40 bucks a piece anymore. But according to a quick internet search, the 6AH6 and even the 6AU6 can be substituted in those locations with little consequence. And both of those are more readily available and they're not that expensive. I have a lot of cleaning and inspection ahead of me, and that'll be the subject for the next video, along with the list of repairs and restoration that I'm going to commit myself to on this radio, and hopefully it actually is salvageable when I get all that done. So thanks very much for watching this first of what should be several videos on a repair and restoration of an HW101, and until next time, bye for now.